Good afternoon. Um, I'm Mark Lewis, the Executive Director of the Emerging Technologies Institute at the National Defense Industrial Association. And let me start off by thanking all of our attendees for your support of NDIA and the Emerging Technologies Institute, and especially to thank you for joining us for today's webinar, which is Directed Energy 101 with Mark Neese. Uh, this webinar is part of our Tech Thursday series, uh, where we're distilling complex technologies into introductory webinars uh, on, this, on science and defense implications. Um, I think, I think uh, our listeners know that the Department of Defense recognizes directed energy as a critical technology area. It's going to have a significant impact on the future of U.S. national security. Directed energy weapons, including both high energy lasers, high powered microwaves, provide the ability to disable, damage, even destroy adversary electronics and communications, and potentially other enemy systems, facilities, personnel through non kinetic means. Um, so, to this end, the DoD has initiated a set of R&D programs that build direct energy weapon systems, engaging both primes, small businesses, small tier suppliers, and, and universities as well, laying out very ambitious deployment plans for this, this, this class of weapons. So I'm, I'm sure, sure uh, you all like me are very, very eager to hear what, 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 what our speaker today has to say. Um, let me begin with a few administration uh, administrative remarks first. Uh, as I think you all heard as, as the, the, the uh, webinar began, um, all attendee lines are muted. Um, if you do have a question during the webinar, please feel free to submit your question in the question box in the webinar panel on the right-hand side of the screen. Um, we will do our best to get through all the questions during the question and answer period at the end of the webinar. Um, no guarantees, depending on the volume of questions, but we will certainly do our best. Um, please note, we are recording today's webinar. Uh, that's not only for uh, you to listen to at a later date if you wanted to go back over material, but also for members who are unable to attend and, and finally, for, for any, any member who wants to review the material at a, at a later date. Um, that recording will be posted uh, probably within a, the next few days. It'll include the recording, slides, and answers to the question and answer uh, in the question and answer portion of the webinar. Um, and that'll be on NDIA Connect for your review. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, today's speaker, uh, Mark Neese. Um, Mark is the Executive Director of the Directed Energy Professional Society, or DEPS. Uh, DEPS fosters research and development in directed energy, that includes high energy lasers, high power radio frequency technologies for national defense and civilian applications. Um, also, also uh, uh, pursues professional communication and education in the area of directed energy. Uh, Mr. Nice has, has been working in this, this area for quite some time. He, is, he has retired twice from federal government service, uh, the, most, the last time in December 2012. And that came after 37 years of military and civilian service. Um, he pre previously retired from the U.S. Air Force as a colonel, uh, and that was in October of 2004. Uh, Mr. Neese is formerly the director of the High Energy Laser Joint Technology Office. So in that role, he worked for the Assistant Secretary of Defense, Research and Engineering, and he supervised the research and development of solid-state free electron gas laser devices, beam control technologies, lethality analyses, and the modeling and simulation tools that create military applications of laser energy for combat operations. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn you all over to Mark Neese, who's gonna tell us everything we need to know about directed energy in, 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 a, in a one hour seminar. So Mark, over to you, thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Lewis for the uh, kind introduction. And um, I'm happy to be with everyone today. As mentioned, um, I am the executive director for the Directed Energy Professional Society. And um, through that, we are the education and advocacy arm for the directed energy community. So we host a number of um, events throughout the course of the year uh, for the community to come together and talk about the research, technology development, and demonstration activities for the uh, community at large and the capabilities that are being developed. So the first question is, what is directed energy? And think of this as the uh, non-kinetic application of force um, on a intended target via electromagnetic energy. Uh, and that electromagnetic energy, as was explained, can be either um, in the use of a high energy laser uh, or in a high power microwave or high power RF device. Um, some of the advantages uh, of directed energy is that it is speed of light delivery, which means that uh, these electrons and or photons are traveling at the speed of light. It allows for precision engagement 
on the intended target. So you think of a spot size that could be, say, the size of a baseball on a target at several kilometers. Uh, so we can uh, very precisely um, target the uh, the intended um, destruction uh, and or disabling of a certain uh, target system. It allows for graduated effects, which allows us to uh, dial up the power as need be to uh, provide the desired effect. <clears throat> and a fairly low engagement cost in that uh, all of our systems now are driven um, solely by electrical energy. We have transitioned the uh, directed energy community to a solid state technology and everything is powered by the uh, diesel fuel uh, and or uh, electrical generators uh, that are commonplace throughout the Department of Defense. As mentioned, uh, directed energy is one of the uh, critical technologies focused under the Department of Defense um, CTO office uh, under usdr &E. There are a, um, a number of activities and you can see in this appropriations funding uh, profile how the, uh, the portfolio is established and kind of stabilized at a little bit over a billion dollars a year investment in science and technology demonstration and experimentation activities across the, uh, the various services and the organizations that uh, support the directed energy portfolio across the uh, department. Today, we're gonna cover a number of uh, service and agency um, high energy laser efforts uh, that are covered. Um, in this uh, forum, we can talk a lot about the laser activities that are going on. We won't talk much about the high power microwave activities that are going on because that comes at a different classification level, uh, but we will touch on some of those capabilities. Uh, you can see that all the services um, have a um, interest in this uh, technology. The Navy through their rapid prototyping, experimentation and demonstration um, portfolio has a number of uh, ongoing activities that we're uh, working right now. And we'll cover each of those in a little more detail. The uh, Helio system, uh, which is a um, integrated capability onto our DDG platforms. The uh, SSLTM experimentation campaign, which just completed its activities um, on the LPD-27. A counter ISR capability under the uh, name of Odin and some technology development associated with the, uh, the growth of high energy lasers um, to scalable uh, uh, power levels that are necessary for the mission sets that are interested in. We'll cover all those in a couple of charts. The Army has uh, a number of various power level high energy lasers on uh, their various platforms, their trucks. Uh, they're looking at that capability for ground-based air defense indirect fire protection, counter rockets, artillery, and mortar capabilities. The Marines as a mobile capability are looking at lower power systems, largely for counter UAS capabilities, which are proliferating throughout uh, the areas that they, um, they work in. They're looking for to field a mobile um, ground-based air defense capability in the very near future. The Air Force, as one would expect, is looking at self-protection of their airborne platforms. There's an ongoing program called SHIELD that we will talk about uh, that looks to um, protect uh, the, uh, the aircraft in the transonic and subsonic regions against both um, counter air-to-air -air and counter ground-to-air uh, activities. Also an experimentation campaign that we'll touch on that they've recently completed looking at both uh, high energy lasers and higher power microwaves for forward uh, air base protection. And we'll touch on the uh, Special Operations Command uh, interest in developing an airborne capability against um, the um, soft targets that, uh, that they have in their interest portfolio. 
leading the way for our high energy laser systems are uh, both the Navy and the Army, uh, looking at uh, maritime and ground capabilities. And you'll see on the bottom uh, that uh, some of the areas where we're investing our science and technology dollars across the DE portfolio. Technology development has been the focus of the, uh, the investments over the past uh, 20 years uh, in doing that. Now, as we're starting to field systems and demonstration capabilities, we're also taking a look at the manufacturing readiness of our industrial partners to meet the demand signal as these systems prove their value in, uh, in ongoing activities. We're working diligently to integrate directed energy capabilities into our warfighting uh, systems. And so integrating the, uh, the capabilities into our combat systems, both in the maritime and in the uh, ground-based activities is an ongoing activity. We'll touch a little bit more on that. At this time, size, weight, and power are still dominating factors. Uh, these systems tend to be large. And so placing them on large platforms is the optimum uh, decision point at this point. We've got to drive them to be lower so that we can execute and bring them out. And one of the keys for us is that the capital uh, cost of acquisition is still high. The dollar value to get to the first shot of a directed energy system is high. And we all admit that. Um, where we start to see value in the directed energy systems, as we noted before, is that um, there's a lower cost of operation every time you take the second, the third, the fourth shot with the DE system, the operating cost comes down substantially. And with these demonstrations and experimentation campaigns ongoing, we learn a lot about the logistics supply and the support activity that's required to field these capabilities in with our current uh, warfighting efforts. For our Navy initiatives, uh, using, as I said, the RPED process uh, to mature, and you'll see what that looks like in an upcoming slide. So we've got a number of activities. I said the um, solid state laser tech maturation just, compete, just completed a year long experimentation campaign on the LPD-27, uh, the USS Portland, um, where it demonstrated its capabilities with a 150 kilowatt laser system uh, to track uh, and engage targets of interest uh, that were out there. Um, it was able to participate in uh, one of our Pacific Rim exercises, demonstrating its capability not only as a lethal shooter from a laser system standpoint, but also as an ISR uh, capability when you put a 60 centimeter telescope uh, on the front of uh, one of these platforms and give it the opportunity to um, look at the, uh, the target sets and do positive identification before you ever um, decide to engage with the, uh, the laser system. The Odin system is an optical dazzler that's been integrated now onto five of our DDG platforms. It is, uh, there's a plan to put, uh, finish that uh, program up with eight systems out there. It's a, um, a dazzler, so it's a counter sensor um, so that you can, if someone's looking at you, you can dazzle that, uh, that sensor so that they can no longer use that for precision tracking of a, uh, of a ship in the open seas. As I said, the RHEL capability was there to evaluate growth patterns and, and uh, activities for future ATL systems and to look at um, the slightly different architecture with RHEL with a distributed gain uh, laser system uh, operating in the, uh, the environment for a maritime uh, platform. And finally, the uh, Surface Navy Laser Weapon System, otherwise known as Helios, is a um, growth project that allows us to integrate the capabilities onto a DDG-51 uh, in this case. Uh, it's going on to the USS Preble, uh, and it is fully integrated with their combat engineering capability. 
So now uh, sitting in the combat engineering instead of a, a separate uh, uh, operator station uh, that uh, only can engage targets when the laser system is allowed to, this is fully integrated with their combat capabilities so that the, the uh, sensors on board the DDG can determine whether it's useful to engage uh, the, uh, the, the upcoming target with either the laser system or many one of many uh, kinetic effectors that would be on board that DDG. It's uh, it's taken proven technology and is integrated again uh, with a uh, a large telescope onto the uh, front of the platform and will gain a lot of knowledge uh, of the system and how it works. It completed a test period at uh, the uh, Wallops Island uh, Naval Facilities. Uh, earlier uh, this this calendar year has been delivered to uh, the, to the docks at uh, San Diego and has been integrated onto the USS Preble uh, during its um, uh, refit uh, activities and will uh, be set to sail sometime we uh, we trust uh, at the beginning of calendar year 2023. As expected, the Navy has a strategy and a roadmap that goes with that. The systems that we've all talked about are in increment one of their Navy laser family of systems. And all of them have been used to help develop not only the, uh, uh, the tactics, techniques, and procedures that one would engage with a, uh, with a laser weapon system in a maritime environment, but also feeding into the next system, which is increment two of their capabilities. In addition to that, uh, they have developed a uh, advanced beam control system called Hellcap uh, that is being integrated and tested at the uh, contractor facility now. Uh, they expect that uh, capability to be integrated onto a platform in the fiscal year 24 timeframe. It is leveraging a laser development program from the uh, Office of uh, Secretary of Defense, r &E, uh, under the Critical Technologies Organization, uh, to scale up the power levels of a high energy laser to 300 kilowatts, uh, which will then buy them the, uh, the capability to engage the anti-ship cruise missile mission set that they're interested in from a, uh, an increment two uh, level capability. They're, like I said, they're leveraging um, the high energy laser scaling initiative activities from the Department of Defense uh, that is, is building multiple um, high energy laser systems for uh, the advanced threats that we see emerging from our unfriendly uh, non-allies. Under the Army initiatives, uh, again, multiple activities. And if you looked at the, uh, at the um, appropriations portfolio, the Army has become very engaged over the last couple of years in a number of demonstration capabilities. We'll talk about some of those. Uh, first and foremost was the high energy laser mobile test truck, which in, uh, put the first 50 kilowatt class laser system onto a mobile platform demonstrated capabilities for counter UAS and counter RAM systems um, in, a multi in uh, multiple field demonstrations in uh, Yuma uh, and Fort Sill, as well as the uh, uh, MIFIX experimentations, maneuver and fire integration experimentations that have been conducted over the last couple of years. The Army's Rapid Capabilities and Critical Technology Office has taken over management of the DE portfolio for the United States Army, uh, working in close con uh, concept with um, the uh, Army Futures Command, uh, as well as the um, ASALT folks that develop uh, and work on the uh, technology activities. <clears throat> in the very near future, i.e. by the end of this month, um, the Army will have delivered four prototype systems for their directed energy m shore ad capabilities that will allow them to engage UAS, RAM, and ISR threats. It will leverage the experimentation campaigns 
uh, that uh, have gone on in the last few years, those systems which constitute a platoon of DE capabilities will be delivered to Fort Sill on, on or about the 1st of October of this year, uh, where they will undergo a year-long experimentation campaign. During that experimentation campaign, they will demonstrate the capabilities to both integrate within the uh, MSHORAD overarching um, activities, as well as uh, the uh, specific uh, techniques and procedures necessary for uh, the use of DE in a uh, uh, base protection type of uh, capability. The Army is very excited about this. They've invested heavily in this, and um, the RICTO uh, is, is doing a, uh, an exceptional job of managing multiple programs for DE capabilities across their portfolio. Uh, from the high power microwave capability, they're looking at a counter UAS capability leveraging off of the Air Force's Thor program, which we'll talk about in a couple of charts, and its capability to basically put up a uh, electromagnetic shield or wall that, uh, that takes multiple and takes out the swarming UAS uh, capabilities uh, when, uh, when being used in a forward operating location. And finally, the Army's uh, leveraging the Valkyrie program, which is their indirect fire protection capability increment two, which again will leverage one of the high energy laser being developed under the, uh, the OSD HELSI program will integrate a capability onto a, a tactical vehicle um, at 200 plus kilowatts. And again, is looking at its capabilities for both UAS RAM and uh, cruise missile defense for our, uh, our Army, cap uh, Army fighting capabilities. The Army has demonstrated, as we said, um, <clears throat> in a mobile platform, both 10 kilowatt and 60 kilowatt capabilities in the past couple of years. They've demonstrated these in a number of locations, as we said, uh, at Yuma, at, uh, at the White Sands Missile Range, uh, where we can engage targets above the horizon uh, because of the uh, protected airspace that's there. <clears throat> and um, also at the, uh, at the Fort Sill MIFIX demonstrations over the past couple of years. It's uh, been very successful. You can see that it goes on a fairly large vehicle at this point. Another reason why we want to, uh, to drive the swap down. The plan with uh, DEM Shorehead is to take that similar capability and put that now onto a mobile striker platform, which is what uh, the Army will be working with over the next year on their experimentation campaign. The Army has a, uh, a strong program uh, and a roadmap for developing those capabilities. As we said, one prototype for DEM Shorad has been delivered. The other three will be delivered here um, in the next 30 days uh, for the uh, system to uh, be demonstrated. And as noted there, um, after a year long experimentation campaign, the Army will make a decision to uh, proceed forward with uh, that capability if it proves its value um, in, uh, in a uh, fire's uh, protection capability. Adjoining that is the uh, Valkyrie program, which you see uh, Shipset 1 is to be delivered here in the uh, calendar year 2022 timeframe. That high energy laser system has been developed and delivered uh, down to Huntsville to uh, the folks uh, that worked this technology both at the RICTO and SMDC. They were going to uh, leverage those capabilities and then buy four prototypes in the fiscal year 24 timeframe based on, uh, uh, on those integration capabilities. And as we said, they're also interested in a counter swarm UAS capability, leveraging the high power microwave technology being developed at the Air Force Research Laboratory. Uh, indicating that the DE community does indeed collaborate and work together uh, regardless of service um, stovepipes and allows us the capability to bring a, a system in 
that can serve multiple services and multiple capabilities. On the high power microwave side, uh, we've demonstrated a number of systems uh, that have been deployed. The Air Force has taken all three of these systems, Phaser, Thor, and Elwiz, deployed them overseas in experimentation campaigns in various um, AORs uh, over the past 14 uh, to 18 months. They've got a lot of knowledge on that. One of the things that's important to uh, look at is that our tracking engagement similarities are very uh, consistent between the DE capabilities. And so working with uh, the newly appointed um, joint uh, UAS uh, office, the JCO, uh, that uh, Major General Sean Ganey runs out of, uh, out of Washington, um, the tracking and engagement capabilities of both uh, our radar systems and our optical sensors that are inherently uh, part of our DE capabilities have been integrated into a, uh, an architecture that is now common amongst uh, all the, uh, the capabilities there. As mentioned, the, uh, the newly designated Joint Directed Energy Tech Transition Office formerly the technology office, has a long history of pointing and tracking development that has been implemented and used uh, across both our HPM and our HEL systems. So the, uh, the radar handoff to our DE tracking, the algorithms, the multi-target tracking, and the ruggedization of those systems are all common across our DE capabilities as we bring them into the experimentation activities. As one would expect, the Air Force is principally interested in self-protection of their airborne assets against both uh, surface-to-air and air-to-air -air missile threats. Uh, and so the, the SHIELD program being run by the Air Force Research Laboratory is looking uh, to uh, put a capability. Uh, it's no longer going to be 2021. That, uh, that date has slipped out now to uh, the 2023 timeframe based on some integration challenges uh, that are experienced. Um, and one should say that's not unexpected uh, for us to encounter some of those integration challenges, particularly as you try to integrate something onto a pod, onto a fighter aircraft, uh, which is what the Air Force is doing. The uh, challenges there are significant and it takes a little bit longer than, uh, than sometimes a uh, a PowerPoint schedule can uh, can get you to. Uh, it's integrating a Lockheed Martin compact laser system with a Northrop Grumman beam control, a Boeing supplied uh, pod uh, be integrated together and then eventually demonstrated on an F-15 platform um, in the 23-24 uh, timeframe of the current plans. A roadmap for the Air Force uh, laser systems. Uh, as noted, we have used um, high energy laser ground based systems for air based defense. Those have been deployed largely to look at uh, counter UAS capabilities. Those systems um, have been successful. Um, the lessons that we learn from those experimentation campaigns is both in, in the development of tactics, techniques, and procedures. It's amazing what uh, can happen when you put uh, these capabilities in the hands of a soldier, sailor, and airman uh, as they're operating these systems. Many of them uh, for our ground-based capabilities um, are uh, the, uh, the execution comes from an, an Xbox controller type of activity, uh, which is inherently um, common uh, to the soldiers, sailors, and airmen who are using those, um, they, uh, they tend to uh, pick up that, uh, that technology very quickly. Uh, the experimentation campaigns were recently completed for both the uh, Hellwiz, Phaser, and Thor systems uh, that were uh, deployed. We learned an awful lot about logistics support uh, during those experimentation campaigns as well. What it takes to support those in the field, what it takes to maintain them, uh, mean time to repair, mean time to failure, where our failure modes are uh, with those systems, 
and where we need to selectively spare the systems as we put them out there on these long-term experimentation campaigns. Every bit of information that we gather from that is useful because it comes together and allows us uh, the uh, ability to hone in on uh, where the real um, nuggets are from an operational capability, where the system works well, where the system has its challenges, and where the uh, challenges in our um, supply chain management uh, are going to come forward and what we can do to perhaps um, stockpile things that uh, would, uh, would otherwise not be uh, inherently in our, um, our standard uh, reserves and capabilities. As noted there, the shield system in that 2025 timeframe is to look at uh, you know, capabilities um, first on a potted system, and then how can we integrate that internally onto a, uh, our fourth and fifth generation capabilities. And then looking in the, the long term is how we notionally could uh, in, uh, integrate those capabilities internally uh, to a sixth gen uh, so that we could look at um, hard targets, uh, both uh, in, in flight and uh, surface targets that would be of interest. Uh, to be able to engage with a high energy laser system. As noted, the Special Operations Command is very interested in some of these capabilities. Uh, you see a picture of a C-130, uh, which previously demonstrated a laser capability with a chemical laser system in the 2009 timeframe, uh, now being uh, fully integrated with an electric laser system. Uh, under the AHEL program and will be demonstrated uh, in, the, uh, in the next year. It's, uh, the system is in integration on a palletized capability and uh, will be integrated onto a test platform and demonstrated here over the next uh, 12 months. In addition to that, a potted Raytheon uh, capability was integrated onto a uh, A64 Apache helicopter. It demonstrated capability to track and engage at low power um, targets that were of interest to the uh, spe special operations community. And so all of this technology development uh, spread out across uh, multiple uh, services, multiple agencies, multiple activities, gives us kind of a feel for where we can take this technology. Technology development is great in and of itself, but if you don't apply that technology to uh, the warfighter capabilities and the warfighter tools that are common uh, to uh, th that are common for their use, um, it doesn't see as much value. We have deployed systems in the past where, if we didn't have the right training material, if we didn't have the right um, capability definitions to the soldier, the sailor, the airman uh, that they were using, the system didn't get used to its full operational capability. So from a modeling and simulation standpoint, we have developed and verified um, 12, uh, actually 15 now, um, modeling uh, capabilities for weapon systems. Uh, they start from uh, the physics-based systems and go up to our engagement and, uh, and mission capabilities. Uh, they are being used for our service analysis of alternative capabilities and are used commonly across the services and agencies for uh, their modeling capabilities. Linked to that are lethality measurements. We do a lot of work uh, developing uh, vulnerability modules for various systems, components, and materials. A uh, database has been developed for all that, leveraging 30 years worth of laser uh, activity and, and information. It's available to the community through the DEJTO's DE2AC function, which is a IAC-like function focused specifically on uh, the uh, directed energy capabilities. It is a, um, a, a great source of in-depth information on directed energy and its 
core function is to collect that information and then disseminate that to the community at large through the Directed Energy Joint Transition Office for everyone to use and to be able to share that, uh, that knowledge uh, across uh, their development activities. So with that, I'd like to open it up to, uh, to questions. And uh, many of uh, you are familiar with the uh, deployment, uh, the early deployment in the 2014 timeframe of the laws system uh, that went on the USS Ponce. That uh, system was intended to go on for a four month trial. Uh, the advantage of the ISR capabilities that you can see in that upper left hand uh, picture deemed it uh, viable to the commander of the Ponce. And so the system was left on board operating uh, in its capability for a th three year trial. The information that we garnered off of that uh, three year deployment in terms of logistical support um, and more importantly, the operational capabilities um, answered a number of questions and allowed the, uh, the community at large to move forward faster. Uh, one of the interesting piece parts that we got out of that was the actual data that showed that the captain of the ship uh, wanted to use the ISR capability 23 hours a day. And the only reason that we took it down uh, at all was to clean the window on a recurring basis from the sea spray and salt spray that uh, would collect on it. But the ISR capabilities weren't diminished uh, during its operations and it successfully um, completed a three-year tour in the uh, Persian Gulf. Um, and <clears throat> another interesting note here is that um, after they in, uh, put the, uh, the system on board the Ponce, they engaged some uh, targets uh, that they had launched themselves. They took those videos and you can find them on YouTube uh, and put those out to the public. And the Ponce was given a fairly wide berth in the Persian Gulf for the three years that uh, the system was out there and deployed. So with that, I'll open it up to any questions that uh, might be there. Dr. Lewis? Mark, thank, Mark, thank yeah, no, thank you very much. Um, and we've already got some questions rolling in. So, so the first question is one that's uh, near and dear to my heart. It's a question about the linkage of directed energy and hypersonics. And the question is, there's been a lot of recent reporting about the need for capabilities to counter both Russian and Chinese hypersonic weapons. DE has been mentioned as a capability to counter advanced missile systems. Do you see this as a high priority for uh, our DE efforts right now? Uh, so in, in the original roadmap, yes, the, the answer is yes. We see this as a capability. It needs to be fully investigated uh, to make certain that we don't overpromise um, capabilities that DE can do, uh, but certainly applying heat to a, um, to a hypersonic um, target um, can disrupt uh, the, uh, uh, the airflow and or the um, uh, protective tiling systems that would be on one of those systems. So yes, we see a capability, but um, the technology for that at this point is still being uh, developed. It is captured in the overarching OSD roadmap uh, being, uh, being in, put in place right now. Very good. Um, now we have a question uh, about optics, and, and that is, are, are there unique optics or optical components that are needed for successful directed energy systems? And the answer is absolutely. So the optical systems that are, are there, um, the coatings that are required for high energy laser operations are very specific to the Department of Defense. One of the things I didn't mention is that, you know, we leverage heavily um, off of uh, commercial industry for the development of high energy laser systems because the commercial cutting and welding industry is very interested in high power uh, operations uh, with very good uh, precision cutting and welding. In order for us to do our job, they do theirs in millimeters, we do ours in kilometers. So in order for us to do that job, we have to have very good optics and the coatings uh, systems on there are very specific to the Department of Defense, which again uh, 
drives us into specific investments into high power laser optical coatings for these systems. Very good. Um, next question. This is an interesting one. Um, is it feasible to use lasers to beam power to devices remotely? The answer is yes, um, and uh, and has been demonstrated uh, in a uh, both a ground to space uh, application and a space to space application um, at lower power levels. And so now we're looking at the ability to scale up power, and as has recently been seen. Um, uh, certain organizations are very interested in looking at space to ground power beaming capabilities now to provide um, electricity uh, to areas that might otherwise be underdeveloped for those capabilities. So we're looking at the, uh, the full magnitude of power beaming uh, across the uh, perspective uh, for us to be able to uh, transmit energy. So if I if I could actually ask my own follow up on that one, um, so what sort of efficiency levels do you think are achievable for that sort of power beaming? I know lasers aren't always the most efficient systems, and then there's you know, efficiency on the collector side. So our laser systems right now um, operate at about uh, 35 to 40 percent overall efficiency from uh, a conversion of uh, electrons to photons. We have demonstrated the transmissive capabilities uh, to, to keep that cap uh, to, uh, transmittable energy um, in a uh, spaceborne relay capability up at the, uh, the high 90s uh, from a power transmission. So the ability to move it from one mirror to another mirror and back to a ground-based system. So the application is, is there. Um, it requires some further research and, and activities, but um, I think that we're going to uh, to see that it's a viable option for power power beaming and power transmission. Yeah, I, I could imagine, especially if I had, say, a, a, a extra power on board, say, a ship, I could use a laser to do remote powering of UAVs that are that are in orbit around the ship, for example. Um, sounds like a great application. Yes, sir. Okay, hey, uh, so here's a question that kind of takes us in a whole different direction, which is um, the, the, the uh, questioner is asking, what legal or policy restrictions are in place on the use of directed energy weapons? So the policy restrictions in place right now, excuse me, are, um, are focused on the, um, the capabilities, the, the wavelengths that we primarily used for our high energy laser systems are um, inherently unsafe uh, to the human uh, eye. <laughs> and so we have restrictions in place that prevent us from developing high energy laser systems to be used to intentionally blind uh, combatants. From an anti-material aspect, there are no limitations on our laser systems. We do, in test and training activities, look very closely at the impact of the photons we're projecting into the atmosphere and into space in order to protect uh, both other airborne and spaceborne assets uh, from those uh, photons. But there are no restrictions in place on anti-material effects for either high power laser or high power microwave activities. Uh, in addition to that, there is a um, system that was developed by the Air Force Research Laboratory and now being uh, further, uh, further developed by the uh, Joint Intermediate Forces Capability Office, uh, an anti-personnel capability called active denial, which uses a high power microwave system. The human trials for that were extensive. The, uh, the protocols for the use of that system were, uh, were, were very in-depth. And so there is uh, you know, a joint service organization down in, uh, in San Antonio that looks at the human effects associated with directed energy and ensures that the systems that we put out there 
we understand uh, the aspects and the inputs uh, that come from the uh, the use of a direct energy capability and and what potential effects that could be on uh, on on the human engagement. So there are significant protocols in place that protect that. There are policies that are in place that prevent us from using it from a intentional blinding. But for an anti-material effect, which is the preponderance of capabilities that we're working on, there are no restrictions for a directed energy capability. Very good. Now we'll get actually now from a from a fund from a from a policy question to a funding question. So one one of our participant asks participants asks uh, starts out by saying funding seems to be flat for direct energy across the services. Is that true? And do we expect the funding to grow from where it is today? So the the funding, if you if you you know went back and looked at the profile, you'll see that the Army's funding profile has increased significantly over the past couple of years with the uh, their systems that they're bringing into play. Um, the Air Force and Navy um, funding profiles have stayed fairly level. We saw a drop off with the Missile Defense Agency um, as it shifted away from its previous program, the airborne laser capabilities and looking at boost phase intercept into some terminal defense capabilities and, and an increase in uh, within the OSD portfolio in, uh, in investment. Um, so yeah, all in all, it balances out, but you see shifts within the uh, services based on their individual focuses uh, and or uh, areas that they're, they're moving away from. Um, that being said, additional money never hurts. Um, <laughs> right. This is one of the uh, technologies areas that you know we're working very diligently on, and there have been some recent uh, papers written that um, in order to promote and push the technology faster to the field, um, the investments need to be increased in order for us to be able to do these, uh, continue the experimentation campaigns and the uh, and the demonstrations that we're putting forward. So that's a good lead into an, another question we have from one of our participants, which is why has it taken so long to field a high energy laser system? And and is there is is there a significant is there a single or or a set of technical challenges that have been limiting the delivery of, of operational DE? So I would say that the, the the biggest change that we've seen in the DE portfolio over the last 15 to 20 years is the move to solid state technology. On the laser side of the house, um, we developed you know in the uh, in the 80s, the 90s, the early 2000s a number of systems, megawatt class laser systems that were based on uh, chemical reactions. Uh, chemical reactions are very good for ground-based demonstrations. We integrated all of this onto a 747 and demonstrated it in 2010 with the Airborne Laser Program. Um, but the shift over the last 15 years has been to electric laser technology, again, leveraging off of the heavy investment that commercial industry, the precision cutting and welding folks um, have made in developing these capabilities. And so leveraging that um, is, uh, is, is the biggest shift that we've seen in the community. Now, that being said, bringing a new capability online, integrating this and being able to project uh, the laser and or the microwave through the atmosphere and understanding um, the effects of the atmosphere and range has on the systems is hard. It's a tough challenge. And, uh, and with a number of systems, we have seen that it takes longer to get to the uh, desired objective um, than, than we originally planned for. And so I think, you know, this is an exciting time in the DE community right now, because we see a number of systems that are being put forward in experimentation campaigns that we believe are going to lead to program of record activities over the next couple of years and a significant investment in 
not only our technology readiness, but also our manufacturing readiness to produce these systems in, uh, in quantity. Very good. And that, that's actually a nice lead into uh, another question that we've got, which is, uh, it starts out by, by the person asks, uh, you mentioned that you were evaluating the manufacturing base to support direct energy. Uh, can you discuss that in a little bit more detail? And, and do you think we have the necessary manufacturing base today? Well, um, it, it's a great question. And in fact, one that I am involved with, uh, with NDIA and the ETI on is looking at our, our industrial base readiness uh, to meet that demand signal. If these demonstrations are successful, what is our readiness to, uh, to meet that uh, manufacturing demand signal? And the answer is we know there are choke points uh, right now in some of our technology areas. And so there are investments being made by the Department of Defense today uh, to improve those choke points in our manufacturing um, and create the capabilities for us to, uh, to move forward. Also with the, uh, the move to what we call the open system architecture activities, identifying some of those long lead items in the manufacturing chain that, uh, <clears throat> that are necessary come to some level of standardization amongst the various systems uh, that we've talked about today and then start stockpiling some of those long lead items so as to cut down our development timelines, our production timelines from years to months uh, and that capability to address it. So those are investments that are being made today uh, within our systems, um, but um, you know, we're, we're, we're working to meet what we anticipate that demand signal to be in that 2025 to 2030 timeframe. Very good. Um, kind of along those lines, so uh, uh, you had mentioned some of the commercial uses of high-powered lasers earlier on. Um, is there a commercial industry that is interested in this technology across the board? And can that help innovation and also help to drive down costs for the department? And the answer is absolutely. And we leverage that today. So, I mean, uh, in, in almost all of our manufacturing, our, our big ticket manufacturing items, we've gone to uh, you know, precision cutting and welding uh, with uh, laser systems at the uh, multi kilowatt level. All of that is technology that we leverage from a Department of Defense standpoint, um, they are the, uh, the you know the commercial industry is a uh, is a dominant uh, aspect of that. Similarly, um, we look at the, um, the development of battery and uh, energy storage capabilities for electric vehicles and other excuse me, capabilities that are coming along the line. And we're leveraging that technology as well so that we can uh, we can not necessarily have to direct drive some of these uh, electric DE systems, but we can store energy and then use it as need be uh, it, uh, uh, for our engagements. Very good. Um we've got we've got we've got an individual asking about safety issues. In particular, uh, how do we safely deploy high energy lasers? And certainly, wonder about their user interface. But what are the most important safety factors that we would need to consider uh, for the users of directed energy? So the the safety factors that uh, and we touched on that. Uh, you know, there's a group down in San Antonio, a tri service group in San Antonio, that looks at the hazards, uh, the biohazard uh, activity, the bio effects that come from the use of these systems and what are, you know, how do we protect the operator uh, from inadvertent um, activation and or, you know, uh, activities. As we've noted with the high energy laser weapon systems, the wavelengths that we use are particularly um, harmful to, uh, to the eye, the human eye. That's our most sensitive sensor that we have out there. And so understanding uh, the reflected energy that would come off of a target and the impact that might have to a user, uh, as well as protecting us from the, uh, you know, the uh, 
inadvertent activation of the system. So there are safety measures that are in place with every one of these systems and uh, you know, kind of fail safe cutoffs that allow us to turn the energy off in microseconds. Um, a couple of folks have asked questions along the same line, so I'll, I'll try to wrap it into one question is, wh where are we relative to our competitors, especially Russia and China? So uh, the U.S. enjoys a technology advantage over many of our um, competitors in this area. Um, the gap is shortening. Um, the educational systems uh, that we use um, in the U.S. Uh, to develop our workforce and that is the same educational systems that the Chinese and the Russians use um, to develop their capabilities. Uh, so I will say that um, the gap is narrowing. Uh, we still enjoy an advantage. Uh, there are certain technologies that we protect uh, that we make certain that um, our, we share only with our uh, most trusted allies. Um, but uh, it's something that we do pay attention to. We, uh, you know, that starts at our educational levels and, and goes all the way up through our systems demonstrations. Very good. Um, let's see, I think we've got time for maybe one more question. And so let's go back to a technical question, which is what, what are the impacts of weather or even thick jungle foliage in using directed energy systems? So there is an atmospheric um, impact on direct energy systems. Um, you know, there are good days for lasers, there are bad days for lasers. Part of those modeling and simulation tools that we put in place, look at the weather um, impacts worldwide. We've got, you know, years worth of meteorological data that, uh, that kind of tell us when the days are good, when the days aren't good, um, you know, when, when things might um, impact us. And then the ability in those modeling tools to determine what's the impact on any given day based on the meteorological conditions that we uh, we look at. We look at that in a desert environment, in a jungle environment, in a maritime environment. All of those are built into our modeling tools and give us the capability to predict fairly accurately uh, the weather impacts on our DE system on any given day in any given condition. Very good. And with that, I think we're at the top of the hour. So we have run out of time. Let, let me first start by thanking you, Mark Nees, for, for a wonderful presentation. Um, I certainly learned a lot. I'm sure our listeners did as well. Um, let me also thank uh, all of our attendees for their participation, for the great questions. Reminder, we will post a recording of this event on NDIA Connect as soon as we can. Um, as always, also, if you have feedback about our Tech Thursday series, especially if there are topics that you'd like us to see cover in the future, uh, please email us at eti at ndia.org. And I want to take this opportunity, if I can, to just highlight a few of our upcoming events in the Tech 101 series. Uh, September 22nd, we'll have Quantum Computing 101 with Scott Fletcher from the GAO. October 6th, Advanced Manufacturing 101 with John Barnes. October 20th, Nuclear Weapons Technology 101 with Bruce Goodwin from the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratories. And then on November 3rd, Cloud 101 with Matt Bukovic from the Carnegie Mellon, uh, from Carnegie Mellon. Um, registration of information is available on our website or feel free once again to reach out at eti at ndia.org. Uh, lastly, I would like to mention, Mark Nees was also kind enough to mention it himself, but I want to, would like to reiterate that ETI is beginning its own supply chain research study. We're going to be kicking off the, the direct energy portion of that study later this fall and uh, with the help of, of Mark Nees. So please be on the lookout for that. And again, thank you all for your participation, for your great questions, and most especially to our presenter for a very informative webinar. And with that, our session is closed. Thank you all.